For Krimi Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Madiba, Louisa Zondo, mother of the late rapper Ricky Rick, joins me to unpack her book titled Dearest Mariki, A Mother's Journey Through Grief, Trauma and Healing. Welcome, Ma. Thank you very much. In your book, you take the first small steps into facing grief after your son, Ricardo Macado, known as Ricky Rick, died from suicide last year in February. So can you tell us more about your grief and how, after Ricky Rick's funeral, you wanted to go far away and engage with him? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tabi. Um, I, I think it's hard to talk about one's grief because uh, it keeps on showing itself in different ways. So I can tell you that what I experienced on the day when I got the news that my son has passed uh, is, is something that I, I still today cannot put in words. It's something like um, everything just goes away. Nothing, nothing is relatable. It's, it's like, I, I just don't know anything anymore. You know, it's, it's a strange sense that you, you are physically here you are physically doing um, what is required for by the moment, by life, but you are gone. You are gone. There's, there, nothing is making sense. So, so it's really hard to put it in in clear words. I try in the book, but even as I try and put it down, because you know you can't do what I'm doing now with voice when you're writing it. Uh, it just doesn't. It just doesn't describe it. It's just an immense, an immense displacement, lost. You get, I, I just got completely lost. That's how it, it felt. And walking through it in, in large measure felt like I am trying to just make sense. I'm just trying to find. I'm just trying to hold on. I'm trying to... I'm trying to not disappear. It was, it's, it's as if, you know, everything is ready to just wipe me away. So on the day of his funeral, that was the 1st of March, 2022, um, I just get this huge sense that I actually will take that trip that had been planned for a long, long time. It had been planned pre-COVID, COVID stopped it and, it and the planning kept coming up and it was now planned for the 20th of March. I get this huge sense that I actually will take that trip. And I get the sense that when I take that trip, I'm going with Ricardo. And, and when I go on that trip, I'm going to be with Ricardo and I'm going to be in engagement. And that, that sort of gave some, you know, beautiful energy in that moment. And it happens on the day of, of his funeral. So I then felt that, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. So I continued um, with uh, my preparation, going off and take, continuing with my walks, preparing for the mountain. It was very useful in that state of everything being in disarray. It was useful. And so that's how it um, happened, that my journey of trying to find meaning um, had some significance in me walking up Mount Everest to base camp. Yeah. And did writing all those letters in the book help with your healing? Everything that allowed just a glimpse of some sense, you know, anything that allowed just some connection with my son, um, anything that uh, reminded me of things about him, even, even though it very often shattered me at that time because it was so close, even though it very often shattered me, it helped. 
I, I, I got a sense that something was, it came alive. You know, I give you this idea that everything is lost. E even just the sense of being is, is lost. I can see that I'm here, yeah, I'm moving, but it's, it's really not real. It's, it, something is just lost. So yes, it helped a lot to, to put down in writing um, what I was experiencing going up the mountain. Um, I was not used to uh, writing in that way, but, but, but it was a new thing. It helped me so much. I, I did feel like, whew, this is, this is what healing looks like. So I felt like, okay, I'm now healed from the trauma and the grief of losing my son. Um, in those uh, the days of being in the mountain, being in Nepal. But then I came back towards the middle of April, around the 10th of April, I came back and, I, and it was shattering, absolutely devastating to be hit by the reality that I can't move, I can't cope, I'm, I'm shattered. Yeah. And when and how did Ricky Ricky's love for music begin? Ah, uh, I can tell you that even in early uh, school days, primary school days, he was already uh, going into his brother's a bedroom and relating to his brother's posters of all sorts of um, rap and hip hop music icons. He was already uh, relating to music himself um, in primary school days. And in fact, in, in, in family values, um, he, he, he does give that story of how he connects uh, to, to music with an uncle, his uncle Johnny, who's the, the youngest brother um, on his father's side, um, takes him to school or collects him from school every day playing Tupac and just that, that dominates his, his mind, his being. So he really um, had an environment that was filled with music, that type of music, but we, the older ones, filled uh, his environment with uh, our oldies music. And I've come to know that he, 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 it caught on uh, to him as well, and he related to that as well. And tell us more on how Ricky Ricky battled with drugs and depressive episodes. Mm. It's, it's amazing how um, in his early years of university, um, he came to the point where he was struggling with um, addiction, he had been exposed to drugs and he was struggling with the ad addiction and he committed uh, to stay in rehabilitation uh, processes and allowed himself to go into recovery, allowed himself to really look at how he could change life. And as anybody who's been on that path knows, it's not a straight on path. Um, so he had this deep commitment to, 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 to really bring his life to good. And he stayed, but there were relapses. There were moments. It, it had to do a lot with his internal self, his confidence, his troubles about the, the pain of life. Um, he does say publicly his pain um, had a lot to do with um, his own yearning for deep, deep family connection, his yearning for deep social connection, love and caring in, in, in social environments. And he just was affected by things that are sad and bad. And so it was an ongoing uh, a process for him to be in recovery and to remain clean. But as everybody knows, that's, that's a journey. That's a really hard journey. 
And I'm grateful that he spoke about it. I'm really grateful that he spoke about times where he was feeling he cannot cope. Um, but I am, I am sad, and that's why in the Ricky Rick Foundation, which has now been launched, uh, we've started our work with a mental health, mental well-being campaign. Um, it's called the Stronger Campaign, and it's based on a, a, a song that has been put together using the words that Ricky left us with, the words that he left on, on social media, in interviews. All these messages have been put together into a song which tells us about uh, holding on together, building this capacity for us to be connected, to be caring, to be stronger in loving each other together in order to make it through the, the challenges of this world. He said, stay shining. And that was a big recognition that life is challenging, but we have to stay shining. True. Mm -hmm. And you say that Rick Rick's death at the age of 34 gave you an opportunity to reclaim the essence of your life, especially after your own life traumas. Can you tell us more on this? So this is um, a part at the end of the book. I start off with entry into Ricardo's uh, death and my going up Mount Everest and writing those letters to him. So the book starts off with the letters written over the days that I'm walking up Mount Everest to base camp and then goes into the key thing which is talking about who I am and what I have discovered of myself and this is based on the reality that part of Ricky's challenges had to do with the fact that he needed to understand some things that come from us as his parents. He wanted to know some things that come from me and how he experienced me as a parent, as a mother. And when he expressed that there are things that are really causing him to be unable to cope with life, can I just tell him about these things in my life? Why? Why were these things happening? I, I put it in the book. Um, I say to him, I will, I will write you. First, I, I say to him, I'll tell you the stories. I'm unable to tell him the stories. Then I say, I'll write you letters in which I will tell you the story of my life, which means I'll tell you all the stories. I try, and I'm unable to get there. I just am unable to. And that is something I do not deal with at the time when Ricardo is alive. But even at that time, I know, I know deeply that if I'm able to tell my story, this will contribute to my healing, the healing of my family, healing of my children, healing of people around me. But I just am not able to tell my story. I can't look. What it means is, is I can't look into myself. I can't deal with myself. My approach to life is that of putting things in places, and I call them boxes, and trying the best I can to keep those boxes closed. So I can't go there. So I don't tell my son the story of my life. And then uh, it starts, though, when I go up the mountain, I start telling some of, 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 of the feelings. Uh, but when I come back, it's clear that I have to go into therapy. I go into really long and deep processes of therapy. In that process, I do gain some tools for understanding, making meaning of my life. And I eventually do get the ability to start telling the story by writing. And that's how... Um, 
That's how Ricky's life contributed to me going into therapy. And it's in the process of this therapy that I uncovered the traumas that had caused me to, to be really, really cut off, to be shut off, to be disconnected from myself. And it had been a method of my body protecting um, myself from cracking. You know, when, when people say their mind cracked, it's real because some things are impossible to hold and they would crack your mind and you will not be able to pull things together. And that's the way the body does protect itself. But once I went into therapy and I was helped to handle the deep, deep, deep trauma of violence that happened to me in a home invasion, I then gained the tools to be able to speak. And even today I am able to speak about the fact of, um, of rape and its devastating effects. And that's how Ricky's death then, as I put it in the book, led to the process of me regaining my own life. Because the trauma for me happened at the age of 34. And so there is that connection. And lastly, in what way do you think society can attend to and strengthen mental health issues? Whew. I think we all have a role. I think we all have a role. In our minutest spaces, we have that role of realizing that um, we deal with a lot and we just don't even know what we are dealing with, what others are dealing with. There is just a lot that we are dealing with. And if we can approach each moment of our lives with that awareness that we do not know, we do not know what is happening in somebody's life and what is causing them to show up in the way that they do. I do not know what happened to those men who in that home invasion were able to violently brutalize me and my husband the way that they did. I do not know, but I do know that whatever it is that enables us to be so disconnected from our own selves such that we can do such brutal things to each other, is needing to be healed in, com in our society. And therefore, all ways, all ways that we can find to build communities of care, to build communities and circles that are safe for us to ask each other what is happening, for us to know what is happening with the other in our space of connection, and to be able to make those spaces for us to talk. We come into a, a, a work environment, we are all silent, we're in our spaces, we don't even know what is going to trigger the next person. It might just be a color, which just triggers memories of something traumatic that happens, but if you don't have the environment that helps us to breathe, and to be able to feel what is happening and to be able to articulate and to be able to take space to go and heal what needs to be healed in us. We are never going to be a society that centers mental health and well-being. So I say this in a long-winded way in order to emphasize the point that we have got to take the approach that mental health and well-being is the primary concern in every sphere of human endeavor. 
and we need to be doing that. We need to be reviewing our mental health system so that we're not only looking at mental health as, as diseases. We mustn't look at people as diseases. We must look at people holistically as a whole story of life. We are impacted by life as a whole and we must have ways of dancing ourselves out of trauma, of ritualing ourselves out of trauma, of talking ourselves out of trauma, of being, when it is necessary, of being given spaces to go off and heal and be supported in our healing processes. Thanks a lot, Ma. Thank you. That was Louisa Zondo speaking to Criminal Media's Polity about her book, Dearest Mariki.